Well, what I've done so far is a little bit long, but uh, I'm Peter Lingdorf. I'm coming from Denmark. I have been interested in uh, sound since I was 10. I started to build uh, my own speakers when I was 11 uh, and uh, went to high school like so many kids and uh, started to build loudspeakers when I was in high school. And for that reason, I took one year more to finish high school and then I had uh, two jobs each uh, three weeks and then I started my company. So uh, building loudspeakers for my friends and importing hi-fi for my friends. And that is still the same company that I, that I it's the main corporation today, which is uh, Audio Nord International, which owns uh, a lot of other small and big companies. Uh, so yes, this year we come with the new, the last one, the TDI. 3400, which is a dedicated through um, stereo amp main, what can I say, main features, which is room perfect. Uh, Peter has taken care and he, with his team has been uh, working on that point since almost 25, 25 years. years. Uh, uh, of taking care that the room is the key thing that has the most impact in the stereo system. So yes, this one I do have room perfect. Okay. We are very proud of that. Um, you know, of course, more than welcome to come and to listen because sound is always an experience. I'm very, it is. Uh, it's very important to make an experience so you can have the real uh, sensibility and live sensibility on that. Um, just to go back a little bit to my history uh, in, in 70, Five, I got involved with NAD electronics and at that time my uh, frustration was that amplifiers did not work very well with loudspeakers so there was a lot of Japanese amplifiers out there that really worked very well on an 8 ohm resistor but not very well on a loudspeaker so when at NAD we hired N uh, Bjorn Eric Edwardson their famous engineer I was one of the guys putting thoughts into his head and so on. He's a brilliant, brilliant engineer. And we decided that we wanted to make an amplifier that was suitable for driving loudspeakers. And it was suitable for being used with a, with a phono cartridge, which was none of the amplifiers was really designed at that time to drive an actual loudspeaker. They were designed to drive a resistor. So that was why the NAD3020 became so incredibly good compared Such to everything legend. else. Yes. Yes. It was a legend. Mm -hmm. Still a legend. From there, I, I, I ended up actually buying shares in NAD and I owned the company for a number of years. And uh, at NAD, we started to get the first thoughts about one day it will be possible to do room correction. In uh, 1990, I bought Snell Acoustics in the USA. And in 1992, we started a real serious project to make the world's first fully digital room correction technology that would cover the whole frequency bandwidth. And we came out with a product in 1993. Uh, that product was expensive. It was a six channel for multi-channel and so on. But it had superb uh, resolution and everything. In 96, we came out with an NAD processor when I was the owner of NAD, but we soon realized that we could not have a $10,000 processor with the NAD name because everybody expects NAD product cost $300 maximum or something like that. So I actually created a new company called Tact Audio. And uh, in Tact Audio, we did uh, further development and room correction. And it is interesting, uh, we will put on our website soon what we did in 1996, and it is almost exactly what I see people are doing at this show. Um, in uh, 12 years ago, I decided that at that time, we did not get the really good results with the way we were doing room cracks. And we were using a PC, we did the measurement, we could see the frequency response, we could then make a target curve and we would do exactly perfect. But every time we did exactly perfect, it didn't sound exactly perfect. 
So actually, I stopped the whole tech project um, for other reasons as well. But I, I said, no, we have to start from scratch because we're doing things perfectly, but it doesn't sound perfect. It doesn't sound musical. It, it did not make us relax. So I hired, uh, at that time, 30 engineers within a few months. And I asked, you know, all the best engineers I, I knew. We took the head chief of uh, engineering from Bang & Olufs, and we took the chief of engineering from uh, TC Electronics in Denmark. We ripped everybody's best engineers out of the system. And then we started working on a totally new approach to room correction. And what we did was room perfect. And we realized that when you make a measurement and you see the measurement response in a room, what you see as a measurement and what you're hearing is completely two different things. Uh, you can make a normal equalizer where you see the measurement and then you compensate. You can make that work in a dead room, in an anechoic chamber. Because in an anechoic chamber, you have basically a straight path from the sound of the speaker to the microphone. But in your living room, 80% of the sound that you get into the microphone has been somewhere else. So people the have a little bit control of 20% by buying a different speaker. 80% is their room. Exactly. And that is what has to be corrected. So what we did with Room Perfect was completely different. And nowadays, we don't show the frequency response because it is totally misleading. You think then when you make a compensation, and now it's flat, you think, oh, it must sound better, and you listen, and you, but still something that is not right. And that, that is what we have fixed with uh, Room Perfect. And interestingly, uh, since we introduced Room Perfect 12 years ago, we did not change the algorithm for correction. Sorry, and we yeah. go to the show like this, and we set it up, do the room perfect, sit down, and what do we say? Oh, it's it. nice. It's exactly right. It's almost, it has become almost a taboo because the only way you can compensate with, for it is with digital technology. And a lot of audiophiles still think that digital is some kind of evil. And the thing is that if you do digital perfectly, it is pretty darn perfect. If you make small mistakes in digital, it is pretty darn awful. <laughs> and there's not much in between. So if you do things well in, audio, in analog, it's wonderful. If you do a little mistake here and there in analog, it's just a little mistake. It's not horrible. But mistakes in digital are horrible. And there was a lot of people, audiophile companies, who went from analog into digital, but they didn't really understand the digital world. And the digital world is completely different. We, we, you know, we brought out the world's first fully digital amplifier in 1997. Um, and the guy who designed it is one of my very best friends, Lars Rispo. He's also playing the cello. And he's uh, one of the top mathematicians in Europe. Uh, when we did this amplifier technology, we sold the patents to Texas Instruments in the year 2000. And he became number one audio engineer for TI for 15 years. And now he's back with me and we're working together in a company. But if you do not completely understand digital, you can make horrible mistakes. And that's why digital technology has sometimes gotten a really bad name with audiophiles. 2L, for instance, recording company from Norway, when you hear that on a good process, a multi-channel, it is absolutely stunning. It's amazing. And if you compare that to a vinyl record, it's, the vinyl is laughable compared to that, seriously. Actually, with our compensation technology, most of the time, you should absolutely not do anything to your room. 
and uh, if you have already done something to your room with padding on the walls and so on, remove everything. Remove everything Whoa. unless your room is like a bathroom. But if it is a normal living room, remove everything. You may want to have a little bit of uh, diffusion material behind you, but typically, apart from that, take everything out. You do want to have the reflections from the walls because a room without reflections is not natural for your well-being. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Have a good time.